Okay, good afternoon and welcome. This afternoon's session on Big Data Analytics with Microsoft Excel 2013. Uh, my name is Peter Myers, I'm a BI expert, and I have been working in the space for over 12 years. And it's been an extraordinary career, um, tracking with the uh, release after release of the Microsoft products and seeing the evolution of Microsoft BI. So I'm very happy to propose and to present this topic, which is to combine two distinct topics, really, if you're at this conference. You see you have big data or you have analytics and Excel. Um, I thought it was a great idea to bring them together so you could see the solution of big data being built and then how it could be consumed, in this case, with a self-service BI example with Power Pivot Power View inside Excel 2013. This is me, BI expert. Yes, someone detected an accent. Very astute you are. It's actually a hybrid. Um, I'm Australian, based in Melbourne, but I was living in the US uh, for about four years until recently. So it's a bit of a blend, but I don't fool most Americans, but I fool Australians. Um, I have a Bachelor of Business. My background was in business, not in IT. Never studied computers at school, but a natural curiosity with data and a need within my role back in those days with Lotus 123 had me crunching data in the 90s and, um, and just evolved to Excel and beyond and then thought this is way too exciting, so discovered Access. That wasn't exciting enough, so I discovered SQL Server, .NET, and away I went. With my years of experience then, I spent a lot of time training and producing educational content. Should you need to contact me, today is the perfect time and place. Of course, I'm around all week in the exhibition hall, or there are contact details here. Should you download the presentation later, or you're watching this, feel free to reach out to me if your questions aren't answered here. The objectives then in this 75-minute session is to introduce the concept of big data. For some of you, this could be new. Uh, and then to introduce what Microsoft are doing in the big data space. That's HD Insight. And then we can talk about self-service business intelligence built on top of a big data solution, specifically with Excel in this session. They'll also introduce self-service BI features of Excel and demonstrate end-to-end -end how we can produce a big data solution right through to reporting in Excel. Finally, I'll leave you with some resources where you can continue your investigation about what big data can do for you. So this is the session outline. Let's start with introducing big data and Hadoop. So here comes the cute little elephant. I was confused when I first saw it. Why do I continue to see this elephant every time they talk about big data? It took a little while before that question got answered. But in fact, um, the original uh, developer, so to speak, that put together the big data platform, or a big data platform, uh, had a child that had a toy. And it was a toy elephant named Hadoop. And the name just stuck. And I think what's very cute about the big data platform and related technologies and products, they use cute names like Hive and Mahout, which is Hindi for elephant trainer and so on. Um, Pig comes up there as well. So it's a far more colorful array of tools at your collection or rather at your disposal. Now, when it came to a concise definition of big data, I just went to Wikipedia and I thought it came up pretty quickly with this and I thought it hit the nail on the head. So, Wikipedia defines big data as a collection of data sets that are simply so large and complex that it becomes awkward to work with using hands-on data management tools. Difficulties could include the capture, storage, search, sharing, analysis, and visualization. So we're going to see how they can be addressed appropriately in this session and in demonstration. So essentially, big data solutions deal with complexities of high volume, velocity, and variety of data. I'm out of interest in this room today by show of hands. Who already knows that they have to deal with a big data problem. So maybe about a third of you. Okay, in recognition that you either have large volume, so large that it may become difficult or expensive to store this data in relational format. You need to have SQL Server licenses or whatever database engine you're using, and as the volumes grow, it becomes difficult to scale those platforms as well. This data might be flying in so thick and fast, it's just difficult to capture and store and the variety of data. So if you're working in relational format, you're working typically with structured data in tabular form. We have tables consisting of columns and we store our data in the form of rows. But not all data is so simple and straightforward that it can be stored in that format. So you might encounter that you've got unstructured data um, that may not be possible to coerce into a tabular form. These are the challenges that big data can address. So Hibachi Hadoop, one big data platform, that's where the elephant comes in, is a set of open source projects that transform your hardware into a service that can store potentially petabytes of data and allow huge distributed computations to take place. So essentially, you'll need to store that data somewhere, and it can be stored then on a distributed file system. 
and then using the ability to query, uh, what it will do is distribute the query across all of these machines, and then they'll do their crunching, and they'll submit their responses back, which is referred to as a map reduce process, and then it reduces and com uh, consolidates everything into the single query result that finds its way back to the consumer that actually issued the query. So with that simple understanding of the architecture, this distributed architecture, volumes of data, what do you think will be one of the biggest problems that you'll have when you're delivering insights from this big data to a business user? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Networking. Networking, okay, there could be some latency on the network. Thinking there's a bigger problem, especially when the word latency comes up. Let me put it this way to you. How long do you think a user is going to wait for a response before they become tired of waiting? Generally, in, ter in terms of seconds, what do you think? Three. Three seconds? Any higher bids? 30 seconds? Very patient over in that side of the room. Eight. eight. I used to say, maybe 10 years ago, that it was five to eight seconds is what we looked for. And in fact, I would revise that by today's standards and say it's somewhere between three and five. Because what happens is, after that period of time, the users probably got distracted and jumped on Facebook, updated their status. <laughs> Maybe even forgotten the fact that they issued a query. Now, if they do remember that they issued a query and they come back, there's a real danger of misinterpretation because they've context switched. They come back, oh, here's the result. What did I ask for? And Maybe I've forgotten what I asked for. So it introduces numerous problems that if you can't deliver meaningful results in a, in a short period of time, you're not really doing your job as a BI practitioner. So we strive towards that three, max five seconds in latency. Um, this is a huge challenge when it comes to big data because this distributed system is unlikely to deliver a result within three to five seconds. Okay, so we'll explore and discuss the benefits and considerations that you'll need to take on board to ensure you can meet that requirement of fast response time. Introducing HD Insight then. This is uh, Microsoft's 100% Apache-compatible Hadoop distribution system. Be aware it comes in two flavors. You can have it in the cloud, or you can have it on-premise. So we refer to that as HD Insight um, server or services in the cloud. Today's demonstrations will be done locally, HD Insight server. I'm always very, very careful about doing demonstrations that depend on internet and the cloud, and I would hate to have a full dependency on that. So I've opted to have two different virtual machines. One is my HD Insight server, one is my business intelligence machine that will connect to and query that server. Uh, be aware that they're in developer preview at the moment as well. So that's a great thing because if you want to try this out for yourself, uh, you can register and you can download the components or set up a cluster in the cloud and you can play with this in the meantime, potentially at no cost. So let's kick off with a demonstration. Step one is to create an HD Insight solution. Here I am switching across to my HD Insight server. And the first thing I'm going to point out to you is that I have weblog data. This is my big data. Um, I like to work with AdventureWorks as a sample database. Who here is familiar with AdventureWorks? <laughs> it's one of my favorite databases. I'm just waiting for the day that a customer comes to me and says, I'm a bike manufacturing customer that has sales, and uh, we need a data warehouse. <laughs> because I think I've got something pre-built for you. All right, but what the data warehouse doesn't store, and for reasons of practicality, is weblog information, that according to the online sales that we have, um, there's huge volumes of data. Every request that comes into the web server is logged in text form to the file system. Um, I have a representative small sample of big data here. You'll see that I have weblog for the years 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. Not really big data, but for the purpose of demonstration, I think you'll get the concept. Now, what we see is that the weblogs include comma-separated information, so we've got the IP address, we've got the authenticated user, each session, and there could be multiple requests on a single session, has its own identifier, and then we have date and timestamp. Be aware of the format of this, pretty standard. Unlike you Americans, I like to switch things around. It actually goes year, month, day, uh, and then hour, minute, second. What follows then is the request that was made, in this case, a GET request to a particular ASP.NET web page. And if note is that when they browse in the query string, we can actually pick up what product they were browsing to. And this could be very useful 
in uh, allowing us to analyze what people are browsing by product. Request, status, and then the number of bytes that were transferred. So here's my volume of big data. What I'm launching here then is the HD Insight dashboard. And this is where I can go ahead and use JavaScript and Hive, as I'll explain in the demonstration, to set up my big data solution. This is all achieved by using the interactive console, switch between JavaScript and Hive. Let me explain. So what I need to do is get those files from the Windows file system into the Hadoop distributed file system. So my first thing is to go ahead and create a directory. Now, if I just issue the hash command there, um, you get to see all of the commands are supported. So of interest here will be that I need to make a new directory. Um, then what I'm going to do is copy from local. Copy that entire folder of the web log into the distributed file system, and then we're just going to check that it all uploaded OK. So first command, make directory that is just data. And then I copy from local. And if I switch back to my file explorer, it's just this folder here. And copy that to the data folder. So now if I go ahead and list what it finds, there's the four CSV files now sitting on the distributed file system. Step one, get the data in the file system. Step two then, in order to query this data, I'm going to use Hive. What Hive does is abstract from you the necessity to use JavaScript to go ahead and issue queries. What you can do, especially if you come from a relational database background, is create a Hive table. It is very, very similar to a relational table. It consists of columns with data types. And then it's that table that you'll go ahead and query using a very SQL-like constructs. So select from, where, group by. All right, and so this means that it's really, really simple to transfer the skills that you have with relational database directly into Hive. And this is how it works. What I'm going to do is copy from my snippets here the create external table statement. I'm going to create a table named weblog, consists of a series of columns. It'll be clearer once I paste it in here. So there's the collection of columns for the table. Row format delimited fields terminated by comma. There's my comma separated format stored as text file in this location, and there's my data weblog folder. So by evaluating this, I have created a table object that we can then query to get access to that big data. Let's just do some metadata querying. Describe uh, weblog. Now take note also of the time involved for the execution of these commands. So just to get some metadata about that table, it took 2.882 seconds, and that's just confirming back to us the data types. I will point out to you that there is no data type for date and time yet in Hive. It's due for version 12. I think this is version 10 of Hive. Uh, what that will mean is that we'll be treating the date and time as a string. We'll just have to work with that and manipulate that when we get to our data model level. And let's look at this, show table extended web log. Wrong. Show table extended like weblog. So what I like to point out here is that when you look at this information about our table, that when you're querying this table, you're really collecting, um, querying under the covers four files. And of course, that would grow dynamically according to the files that are placed in that directory. Finally, just to prove the point that this is just like a table, it is a table. How many rows do we find across all of those files? So what was that latency figure we were talking about? Three to five seconds, okay, bear that in mind. Question in front here. Oh, you were poking three fingers up. Okay, so three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many seconds are we prepared to wait for this? Well, we have no choice, obviously. Any questions? <laughs> Do you mind if I just jump on Facebook? I've got to update my status. Is there, um, is there a, uh, 
Question is, is there a rich dialogue for interacting with this? Um, not that Microsoft have provided yet. They provide this web experience, um, which is fairly consistent. If you're working with Azure in the cloud, you would want an interface like this, the web interface, um, or if you're working on-premise, you'd have this hosted locally on the IIS. No, but I, I guess you know it's just um, a UI to a set of services. So if you really felt keen about it, or some um, company out there felt keen about it, they could easily build a set of tools. All right. So let's take a look at what happened here. There's the result coming back. In total of those four files is exactly 100,000 rows. Not really big data, but it's demo. Uh, what you see on the right here is all of the tasks that took place to achieve that. There's a lot of work going on under the covers. So essentially, this MapReduce process, it fires off the query across all the distributed servers, of which today I just have one, but there could be numerous. And then they send the results back in a MapReduce process that then sends the result, in this case, 100,000 as a single value, back to me. All up, that took 47.911 seconds. OK. Question. Yes, question? Uh, so do you have a, a guideline for the, how many distributed systems you need depending on data? Do I have any guidelines on the number of distributed systems? Well, it, it takes what it takes. So for example, if you needed to query your data through a single object, like this table called weblog, they would all need to be on the one file system, in the one folder. Okay, but there's nothing to stop you scaling this across potentially thousands of servers. This is how this technology has been designed to work. It could be petabytes of weblog data under the covers there. Okay, one other question in the back. Uh, is, there any kind of XML is there any native support for XML? Not that I'm aware. But at the end of the day, if, uh, if you're working with Hive, I, I'm not sure there's a direct way to work with XML, but you would then start programming direct with JavaScript to get to whatever your data looks like. Okay, so there's enormous flexibility there. Hive provides this abstraction from us that if your data is in a certain format, like CSV in this case, um, and it could be semi-structured as well, you might have arrays of data sitting in some of those columns, and you can use Hive to get at that. But if it comes to more complex and unstructured data that you have, you then have to go to a programming approach to um, get to it. Okay, I will take one more question. Does Hive propose the structure of the table for you? Does Hive propose the structure of the table? No, it doesn't. So that um, create, ex uh, create external table command, I had to write that. And I would therefore had to know what the structure of the CSV file was. Okay, part two of the demonstration, then I'm switching from the HD Insight server across to my BI server. So the requirements here in order for me to connect to the HD Insight server is I'm going to have to install the Hive ODBC driver. Pretty straightforward. You can download this from Microsoft. Accept the terms, install. And now I have that ODBC driver available. Next step would be, and this could be the administrator, is you're going to come in and create a data source. So I'm going to create a user data source name you'll see that the Hive driver is now available and basically come up with a user-friendly name for it. HD Insight sounds pretty good. And connecting across to the host, which on my network, is HD Insight. Now, I'm going to use no authentication. You might think that's very strange and probably not desirable. In the developer preview that I'm working from, there is no authentication or encryption implemented at this stage. Do expect by the time it goes into release that you would be challenged for credentials and you'd need to authenticate to connect to your data. Question is, how is that done with multiple data sources? Uh, example? Right, so in order to query the big data, and my demonstration will be using Excel, Excel will actually be Power Pivot, will connect by using that data source name. That will establish the connection, and then we'll pass a statement through on that connection. And that's what that driver is designed to do. Okay, so that's part one. How do we produce a big data solution? Fairly straightforward um, based on the nature of the data that I have. Now wearing a completely different hat, I am a business analyst that is tasked with the job of creating an experience that allows efficient and effective querying and representation of that big data. So effectively, we've got a, a line of questions there that would be, well, where are the web users coming from, when and where, and what types of products are they browsing? They're the typical types of questions you'd expect. Okay, so bear in mind that part of the data comes from the big data, 
the number of requests, the number of uh, sessions, the users, and the rest of the data will come from corporate data. The fact that we have customer definitions, we have product definitions stored in the corporate data warehouse. So my favorite database does have a role to play here today. To bring these together as a single resource that makes sense for a business user or a manager to connect to and discover insight from, this is where Power Pivot comes in. So I'm interested to know from this audience who here has already worked with Power Pivot before. This is about half. Could I just see if it really is half? Those that have never worked with Power Pivot before? Yeah, it's about half. Okay, the great news about Power Pivot is, it's now in its second version. Uh, it came out as an add-in for Excel 2010. All you needed was Office Professional Plus with Excel, and then if you downloaded the add-in, uh, you could extend the native capabilities of Excel to work with data modeling, potentially over extremely large volumes of data. I mean, large volumes of data is a little relative here. Um, on a client, we wouldn't expect to store petabytes of data, but relatively to what an Excel workbook could do, especially when you consider the constraints of what a workbook has in terms of the number of rows that you can have in a single worksheet, does anybody know? Maximum rows in a worksheet. Two million, one million is probably closer to it. It's actually one million forty-eight thousand five hundred and seventy-six, two to the power of twenty. So if you're dealing with more rows than one million forty-eight thousand five hundred and seventy-six, you're going to end up in a little bit of trouble unless you're using Power Pivot, whereby you can overcome that by loading data direct into the model. And the benefits of this volume, as I've just explained, and when you have volume, you typically then have size issues. The good news is that when you store data in Power Pivot, it will load encode and compress that data, typically down to one-tenth of the original size. So you don't have to have such big Excel workbooks when dealing with large data. All right, so this is what's achieved with Power Pivot. The great news in Excel 2013 is that Power Pivot is installed automatically. There's no add-in to download anymore. It's just part of the product. It's just baked in. Power Pivot gives you, and I just love this, name for the storage engine, it's the X Velocity in-memory analytics engine. Effectively, the add-in is installing analysis services client-side. You're probably familiar with Cube's server-side. The same engine for tabular models is now available through Power Pivot. Through a separate window that can be launched, in this window, you can develop the data model by loading data from different data sources, different data formats, including big data. You can relate the tables that you import and then you can enrich the model by hiding columns, renaming columns, producing hierarchies to support navigation. This navigation, in turn, allows you to aggregate your measures of interest at different levels of granularity. And then you can embed business logic in the form of other calculations, like measures and key performance indicators. Together then, business analysts, business users can use this tool to work with larger volumes of data and to produce um, resources that you can connect to and query and report from, bringing together corporate, local, or ad hoc data. Okay, so let's take a look at this in demonstration. My objective here is to build up a Power Pivot data model that brings in the big data, enriches it with other and related corporate data, and then supports the analysis that we know that we need to do, and that is that we need to know who, what is being browsed through the web application. Now, one of the tricks is if you've got Excel 2013 and you launch it looking for Power Pivot, by default, you're not going to see a tab on the ribbon that supports that. So I'm going to go ahead and create a blank workbook here. No tab for Power Pivot. The reason is that when you go ahead and install Excel, it will install the add-in, but it will not enable it for you. I need to come into the add-ins here under Excel Options, and then I turn on Power Pivot. Any ideas why you think Microsoft make us do this? Why don't they just enable it? So you have to make a conscious decision that you need Power Pivot, okay. So we'd expect that if you need it, you've been hopefully educated in how to use it. All right, so let me throw some statistic out at you that uh, Office is perhaps the most installed set of applications on the planet today. There's an estimated one billion installations of Office. And of those, an estimated 600 million active Excel users. So when you consider that each of those are launching Excel, that it slows down the launch process when add-ins have to also be loaded. And it also it takes up resources. All right, so for the 600 million people out there, I'd guess I would suggest that not all 600 million actually need Power Pivot. All right, probably a smaller fraction. So for those that do need it, 
you'll need to go through the process of enabling that add-in. When you do so, you'll then find that you have a Power Pivot tab on the ribbon, and this allows us to launch the Power Pivot window. So before I go ahead and do that, I like to save the workbook. And point out here that the size of the workbook, just an empty workbook with a single worksheet, is 7.43K. And then I go ahead and I launch the Power Pivot window. So this is a separate window that has a direct relationship with the workbook, and this allows you to then uh, define and manage the, the data model. If I save the workbook, we then see that it's still 7.43K, nothing special. Back to the Power Pivot window. Here on the home ribbon is where we can bring in data from a variety of data sources, be them Microsoft data sources, um, OData feeds, I'll use that in my demonstration. Of interest to me right now is the other data sources. In fact, all supported data sources are listed here, whether they're relational, consisting of popular database products, or generic here for OLEDB or ODBC. I think that'll come in handy for our hive. It could be other multidimensional sources like cubes, data feeds like reporting services reports, or data feeds that you find even available across the internet, or files like Excel or text. I'll start with this one here. Provide a friendly name for the connection. And then to build up the connection string, I just use this window. In the drop-down list, we find the user data source names defined on this machine. And that's defined the connection. Next, two options when bringing in from this type of data source. You can bring in from a list of tables or views. So here we go, it's already queried across to the HD Insights server and discovered that there is a Hive table named Weblog. And I can even preview and filter. This sort of surprised me the first time I did it because I thought, hold on, that only took two or three seconds to actually give me a preview of data. But the reality is it's only previewing 50 rows of data. Be very, very careful, let me share with you. If you use this drop-down list to filter the values in a column, it needs to retrieve all of the data to provide the distinct values that you can filter by. Don't do it. <laughs> it's gonna take about 50 seconds just to do that. Now, there's not a lot of optimization topic when it comes to tabular data model design with Power Pivot, for example. Um, but there is one very, very important one. When you recognize that the architecture of this is an in-memory data model, that what you want to be careful is not to introduce into the data model data that is not relevant for your analysis or not relevant for the calculations that you're doing. All right, keep it trim. So when I look at this, I would say, well, look, I don't really need the number of bytes. We could aggregate them, but that's not really something that we're interested to know about. So you can start to remove the columns. And that's what I recall, call um, vertical filtering. Just get rid of columns that have no role to play. Horizontally, we can filter by um, assigning conditions on columns. Like, we're only interested where the result code is 200. Just give me the um, valid requests that were made. So you could do it this way and I choose not to, I'm gonna step back, I'm gonna choose the approach where I can write a Hive query and have it executed, and that way I can execute any statement that's valid to provide exactly the data set that I wanna load. So I'm gonna name this weblog, this will become the name of the table in my data model, and then, just for convenience, I'm gonna use a snippet. And the Hive query here says bring in the date time, account ID, session ID, and a calculation here to extract a substring. Just bring me the characters from character 28, because I know that's where the product ID is embedded into the query string. Bring it in from my web log table, and then here's my horizontal filtering. But only do this where you find browse.aspx inside um, the URL, and where the result was 200. So I copy this Hive query. Paste it in. Finish, and now the table import wizard is executing that query across the, uh, the data connection, and the results will then be loaded into the data model. And this should be, thankfully, the last time we have to suffer this latency of some 40, 50 seconds. All right, once the data is cached in the model, it's then in memory, and we'll discover we have lightning fast querying results from it. Have a question here. Yes, you could. You could do this from SSIS. So we have the ability through an ODBC connection manager to execute any valid Hive statement. It'll bring back a result that can be output. 
So yes, in fact, you could use this in reporting services reports, analysis services data mining, integration services for extract, transform, and load. Another question over here. Yeah, so the query, the Hive query, and this is the question, what's happening is the query is being sent via the data connection to the HD Insight server, and this map reduce job is executing and distributing across all of the nodes in the, on the server. Okay, and then that result is coming back through that path. Map reduce consolidation, and then the result, which I think we now see here, is then returned. So there's a lot more going on than you would likely suspect, especially when you have thousands of servers that are storing your big data. 72,341 rows. We had 100,000 before, remember. Um, the reason is they weren't all requests to the browse page. So that's where we filtered the row set down. This is what it looks like. Be aware in Power Pivot. We can do things like this. We could sort lightning fast. It's all in memory. Even if I had millions upon millions of rows, it would happen instantaneously. I always like to save my work at this point. And now I can point out to you the document size, or the workbook size, has grown to 2.45 megabytes. Do you think that's impressive for 72,000 rows of data? I talked about the compression that we typically achieve one-tenth of the original storage size. I personally am not so impressed with this, um, and for good reason. At least valid reason is all of this data is text data. And text data doesn't typically compress very well, especially if there are a few distinct values. So the encoding that it has to use isn't as good as it would be if there were numerics. So typically we have a lot of numerics in our data, and then you'll find very, very good compression ratios. Switching across to diagram view, this is what I'll refer to as my fact table. The facts are, these are all of the requests, valid requests made to a certain page, and we've extracted the product identifier. To provide context around this, I'm going to introduce data from another data source that happens to be SQL Server. Connecting to my local host and my favorite data warehouse, provide a friendly name for that connection, click Next, and here I am at that same junction. Do I want to write a query? Do I want to go ahead and ex extract from existing tables? Today I'm going to write a query. The reason for this is that when I bring in my customers, I actually want to bring in related data from a geography dimension table so I'm going to join them together as one set. So I'll name this the customer table. I'm going to use this designer to go ahead and build up a valid select statement to extract the data from the data warehouse. So identify the customer table. What I'm going to need is the alternate key. That is the authenticated customer ID that we saw in the web log. This is how I can relate my customer dimension data across to the web log itself. I'll need first name. I'll need last name, uh, gender. And because there's a relationship via this geography key, I can then introduce columns from the dim geography table. City, state province name, and English country region name. Run the query. This is the result that I'm going to load as a single table into the data model. Has anyone seen this uh, query writer before? Doesn't look familiar to anybody? Yes? Where have you seen it? Oh, it's a downloadable add-in? That's news to me. That's good. If it's the same one, I'm not sure it is. I have one that you can convert um, data. No, this wouldn't be the same one. Yeah. This, one this one's been borrowed from another BI product at Microsoft. Yeah, Report Builder. So Report Builder, which extends report writing to business users through a Windows application um, to guide them through the process of designing a query they can launch this exact same query designer. So it's nice to know at Redmond, where they develop these products, that they probably share the same cafeteria. And you had the Power Pivot team sitting there saying, we need to build a graphical designer for queries. It's like, hey, we've already done that. Could we borrow it? And that's how I think it worked. Did you have a question? What version is it? This is from Report Builder 3.0. We technically call it Report Builder. If you go ahead and create a data set, and you choose a relational data source type, and you say, um, build query, I think, or query editor, by default, this will come up. No, no, nope, nope, it's been there since the last five years. You know, it's a little bit sneaky, because um, why would we need parameters over here? <laughs> parameters mean nothing to Power Pivot. Anyway, it's done its job, and essentially that job was to construct graphically um, this query. What I like to do at this point is clean things up. If I just alias these, it saves me renaming the columns later on. 
And in fact, what I can do here is produce a calculation that concatenates first and last name together, alias this as just the customer. This one here can become state, and this one here becomes country. You can rename them later on, but I just find putting them in the definition of the query itself, and there's our table, just speeds things up. I need another table like this. Um, this is a beginner's mistake. I need to bring in more data from the same data source. Let's define the data connection again. No. Go ahead and open up your existing connections, and you'll find that connection already defined. If you open it, it relaunches the table import wizard, and now we'll have two tables defined on the same connection. This one is going to bring in product information. In the AdventureWorks data warehouse, product is what we refer to as a star schema, or rather a snowflake dimension. It's been normalized into category, subcategory, and product tables. Not great from a modeling point of view. We like to um, denormalize. It makes it easier and actually more efficient. So from the dim product table, I'll bring in the alternate key. That is the value that was stored in the query string for the request to the browse page. Uh, also, we want to analyze by the product name, by color, and then related to the subcategory table. I'll bring in the English product subcategory name, and then related to the category here. So that is the result that I'll get back. Now, this table supports slowly changing dimensions of type two, so there are actually multiple versions for the same product code. That's not gonna work very well. That the way that data models work is that relationships are one to many. This should be the one side. And if you've got multiple versions for the one product, um, it's going to cause problems. So I'm gonna have to filter those out. So I'm gonna add a filter in. Effectively, this is building up the where clause the first filter will be, let's limit the data to what we know is useful. We only want finished goods to be in here. There might be components that go into finished goods, but they're never browsed on the web. And then I'll add a second filter that will be to filter out by status. And AdventureWorks just put the word current if it's the current version. These parameters, this is what I'm pointing out, irrelevant to PowerPivot, but they make sense in Report Builder. That's what the where clause now looks like. Again, I'm gonna clean up by aliasing the columns. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat the question? So what happens is, the question is, is the data stored in Excel? Technically, yes it is. It's not in a way that you would think. Most Excel documents have worksheets, they have values in cells. It's not in that format. What happens is that you're building up a data model that essentially is a database that is embedded into the workbook itself. So if you were to um, open up the workbook, so it's essentially a zip file, the open office format since 2007, the docx, the xlsx, if you change the extension to .zip, and you open it up, you'll see there's a folder hierarchy and all of the resources for that workbook are stored in there. What has happened is this data model is actually a backup of an analysis services database that's embedded into that structure of the document. What's very cool about that is it's portable. You give that workbook to somebody, like a DBA, um, they can restore that workbook direct to an analysis services instance to create a new database. It's a one-way transition from a self-service BI data model to become a corporate data model. You can also import from that definition to a Visual Studio project, and therefore a developer could enhance and enrich and deploy a new data model based on the original design or your proof of concept that you've done in a workbook. Proof of concept is an excellent idea for you developers. You don't have to go to Visual Studio. You can mock up a design, get acceptance from it, and then import it into a project. I hope that answers your question. Three tables, two data connections. The data model is coming to life. Now, an important table that you'll need in all data models is a date table. This is how you allow the filtering and the um, analysis by time. So what I've got is a different approach, is that AdventureWorks, for consistency with the self-service BI data models, is that they promote this consistency by enabling and supporting data feeds. So when we educate people on PowerPivot, we say, oh, when it comes to defining a date table, as you will need to do, because we want consistency in the way data is defined in this organization, here is how you do it. Connect using a data feed, browse to SharePoint. In SharePoint, I have a data feeds library. 
and we've catalogued a data feed specifically for date and time analysis. Here's the library, corporate feeds. And that data feed consists of actually two feeds within. There's a time and a date. Okay, we need date information, preview and filter. At AdventureWorks, they work with different time periods, sometimes calendar, sometimes fiscal. I like this checkbox in the top left corner. The optimization is deselect everything and only include what you actually need. We will need the date key that will support the relationship to our weblog data. I'll also need the raw date. I'll explain why in a minute. A date label as a user-friendly description of the date, and then the month label as well. We have quarter, and then we have year. And if I was so inclined, I also have fiscal periods in here as well. So this just makes it very, very easy. For time, what we see here is a time key, the classification of hour, down to the 15 minutes, down to the very minute. The number of rows available through this feed would be 60 times 24. Essentially, every minute of a single day is defined here, and the time key, zero at midnight, 15 here is 15 minutes past midnight, and what would happen at 15 minutes past one o'clock in the morning is the key would be 115. It's the hour multiplied by 100 plus the minute within that hour. Finish, this introduces two tables then based off a single data service. <coughs> and the data model is taking shape. Okay, so the next step is, now that I've introduced the data and I have these five different tables, is to establish relationships between them. Switching across to the grid view then for the weblog table, the first challenge is that this date and time, remember defined as a string, um, actually is composed of date and the time element. Yet, because we have two different tables, which is a tried and tested design, by the way, um, that I need to break this out into two separate keys. So I can introduce a calculated column here using this type of formula. Using the year function, pass in the date and time, and then multiply it by 10,000. Add to it the month number of that date and time, and multiply by 100, and then go ahead and add the day number of that date and time. And that's going to give me the exact key that I need to relate to my date table. Okay, that's worked nicely. Um, actually, it surprised me that I should have really come in here first how forgiving Power Pivot is, and actually told it, yeah, I know it was text data that we loaded, but you should interpret it as date data. Okay, and this calculation still works. I didn't know that it actually do that. Rename the column. This then becomes a date key. In a similar approach, I'm going to add a second calculated column, this time that says, we'll take the hour component from this, multiply it by 100, and then go ahead and add the number of minutes and there's my time key. Switching back to diagram view, you can define relationships in many ways, but I think the drag and drop approach is the most intuitive. Remember that when you do this, you always drag from the many side to the one side. So you're dragging from the weblog table. So in this case, account ID relates to customer ID. Product ID relates to product ID, and so on. Now we have the data, we have the relationships in place, and then table by table I optimize the design for the end user experience that I have in mind. I always start with a date table, it's always um, fundamental, and I've never designed a data model that never has a date table, so it seems the natural choice to start with. For this table, on the design tab, we can come in here and mark this as a date table. The requirement is that you have a column of type date, and that is what this second column has, and that is why the data feed provided it. In doing this, you enable um, a number of capabilities. The first thing is that anything that queries the metadata of this model will understand where date is defined. And for example, a pivot table in Excel, if you're filtering on this table, it will know to give you date-related filters. We can also work with the DAX 
and that's the expression language used for calculated columns and other calculations in the model, we can use time intelligence functions to do things like year to date and so on. The requirement that you have is to include a date table, it must have a date column, and you must have no missing rows from your min to the max range that you have in that table. And all you then need to do is mark this as a date table. Next, friendly names. Day, month, quarter and year. Now a closer inspection of month, if we were to filter month, what we get to see are the distinct values that are found in this column. Do you notice something a little unusual, probably unacceptably unusual? Yeah, not chronologically sequenced. It's, it is by default alphabetically sequenced. So that would prompt me, due to my omission, to come in here and go to the table properties. This should look familiar. You can always come back here and modify the definition of how that table retrieves its data. And at AdventureWorks, they do provide a month key that is the year multiplied by 100 plus the month number, one for January, two for February. So now if I just introduce the month key, I can then come across to this month column. Now, providing there's a true one-to-one -one relationship between the values in these two columns, I can then go ahead and define that the sort for this column will be based on the values of this column. And now we see that they are indeed chronologically sequenced. Next level, and I switch back to diagram view for this because I'm about to define a hierarchy and hierarchies can only be done using this designer. I maximize the table to focus on it and then I just multi-select multi and say create a hierarchy based on these. And then I name this the calendar hierarchy. By the way, the sequencing of the levels, you can adjust them. It actually gets it right most of the time because it looks at the data, the cardinality, and it says, well, that should be the sequence. It doesn't interpret the names of your columns. All right, and then I choose to hide the rest. So the only visible resource in this table will be a calendar hierarchy that will allow the user to navigate from year, quarter, month, down to day. Next, for time, probably rename this. This becomes the quarter hour. And this just becomes the minute. And I create a hierarchy from those three. and then I hide. On to the customer. We have the customer, its city, state, country, and this would become my geography hierarchy. And then I would hide all except gender. And then finally, product. hide all except color. So it's pretty straightforward. Once you learn to do this for about a dozen tables, it doesn't really get any more tricky than that. The purpose of the weblog table is to provide facts about what was browsed and when and by who and for what product. Okay, in a dimensional model, this would be a fact table. Um, the purpose of the related tables are therefore to provide context to your reports or to filter. And when filters are applied, they restrict the rows that are in context. And it's those rows that we would then aggregate to come up with calculations like sum of sales, or in this case, number of sessions, number of customers. So I switch across to the grid view because it's in this pane down here that I can define these types of calculations. These are calculated columns. They use DAX. Down here, it's calculated fields, or what we refer to as measures. Easy way to create them, if you multi-select you can then auto sum, and here's your six aggregate functions to aggregate the values in those columns. I'm gonna use distinct count. The first one then is the distinct count of account ID. If I rename the first part of this expression, and I just call it customers, that will allow me to determine the number of customers, and I can filter by time periods, date periods, and so on. I also like to format that as a whole number, comma separated. This one here, count of session ID, will just become the sessions. So we can determine the number of distinct sessions that have taken place. And then to make use of the time intelligence, we have this date table, 
uh, we're aware that we need to determine what these sessions are year to date. So reasonably straightforward, if you've got that date table and it's marked, is you just say what expression, so go ahead and aggregate sessions, and where does it find date? Well, in the date table, and the date column is where that date is found. And that's what our web, uh, web log table now looks like. I can then go ahead and hide these. It's not relevant for users to even understand that those columns are available. They have three calculations that then they can filter via the related tables. And that pretty much concludes the development of the data model. All up, this workbook, consisting of all of that data, metadata, including the calculations, comes to 3.76 megabytes. Yes, a question? Yes. Let me just clarify, your question is about, up here I'm guessing, on the table view. Sorry, was it here? Design here. Oh, look, it's very, very similar to what Excel will do. And that is when you're building up a formula, it can just assist you by allowing you to browse and locate the function of interest. Um, the question is, can you put VBA in it? No. So the only uh, functions that you can work with are DAX functions. DAX is used for calculated columns and calculated fields, but there is good news for you, and that is there are at least 71 Excel functions that port directly across to DAX. So round, um, mathematical functions, if, and so on, exactly the same. Okay, one more question. Can you program this using the Excel data model? Can you program this using the Excel data model? No. There is some stuff you can do in Excel 2013, like refresh the data model through VBA, but you can't actually modify the metadata of the model itself. You'll need to use the Power Pivot window, as I've demonstrated. All right, so let's just have a look at a quick uh, example of how we could query this. Uh, on the Home tab, let's insert a pivot table to an existing sheet. And what we see here on the right-hand side is the field list representing our data model, and then I can just come in here and say, well, tell me um, sessions year to date. And then we can see the results come back. Sessions year to date won't make sense until you put some time into the query. So from the date, I'll place calendar on the rows, and then I'll expand everything right down to the month level. And I'll also hide the quarter. And if I place conditional formatting here, then you get to see the sessions accumulated across the calendar year. Okay, what latency are we getting here? Sub-second, all right, we're now in the, the area of acceptable performance that we wouldn't have got if we had to query the big data platform directly every time we had this type of query. The technology we're using here, web servers use it, report servers use it, all app servers use it, it's caching. Let's get the data in, and then we can query it fast from the optimized store. But what that will mean is that you're gonna to have to keep that cache up to date. All right, you're going to have to reprocess this data model periodically to ena enable up-to-date analysis. Question? So it's not really big data. Why do you say that? Okay, so the question's about limits. So for the purpose of practicality in a demonstration session like this, I've worked with a small amount of data. But in a realistic scenario, Microsoft have a number of case studies around this, it could have been petabytes of data. I'm gonna address this later with some slides once I've finished with the next part of the theory about benefits that we have and the considerations you'll need to take on board when you're working with real um, levels of big data. I'll come back to that question. All right, so that's the second demonstration. Moving on then to the next topic, which is the visualization. I just showed you a pivot table. Really what I'm attempting to do here is show you some of the great new features in Excel 2013. And one of those great new features is PowerView. PowerView was first released as part of SQL Server 2012 and made available only through SharePoint. And so therefore, it was a web browser experience, Silverlight, the ability to connect to a tabular model, be it PowerPivot or a tabular database with analysis services. You could use this rich interactive web experience to go ahead and create an impressive visualization. 
That capability is now embedded into Excel 2013. Highly visual design experience, rich metadata-driven interactivity based off the definition of your, in this case, Power Pivot model, and it's presentation ready and sexy at all times. It's great for delivering intuitive ad hoc experiences, or they could be um, for canned reports as well. But it could be just for those one-off questions that I've got. It's very easy, and especially for someone that's not particularly educated in report writing, to work out how to get the data they need through this highly visual experience. All right, when you work with Power View in Excel, you can connect to the Power Pivot data model. Remember, this is an embedded data model in the workbook itself, or you can connect to an external tabular database that could be um, a corporate data model hosted on analysis services. Some new features added in 2013, uh, the maps, so Bing Maps, as I'll demonstrate. We can see where these sessions are happening spatially on a Bing Map. Pie charts are added, they're new. The ability to navigate hierarchies in a report is now supported, as are KPIs. Drill down, drill up, the ability to change report styles, text size, backgrounds with images, hyperlinks, and print support are some of the new features to look forward to. Insert ribbon tab, you'll find that Power View is here. It is an add-in. Again, this is not enabled by default, but this one's a little more forgiving. Uh, you don't need to go to the options and enable the add-in. It will just ask you, do you want it enabled from now on? Thank you. So these Power View sheets sit side by side with the standard worksheets that you're probably familiar with. I'll just go ahead and rename this. This will become my web log analysis. There's a filters pane here that allows you to, in the background, filter by something like a year. My demonstration is going to allow interactive filtering. So I'll come in here, we'll name this web log analysis. On the right-hand side is our field list consisting of the visible tables, uh, hierarchies, columns, and in the case of the web log table, there's the calculations. So just to point out that we can do it, if I go ahead and add a picture in here, I can bring in now the logo for AdventureWorks. That's new. And then here on the left-hand side, just by introducing from my calendar hierarchy the year level, it creates by default a single column table. Now, the cool thing about a single column table is that you can convert it to become a slicer. And this is how users can interact and filter, for example, by year 2008. Hmm, what else could we do here? Let's bring in one for month as well. So now another table, a single column table, convert this to a slicer. So now we can go right down to a month. And I could continue to do this, month, day, right down to hour and minute, if that's what our analysis needs. Clicking in a blank area allows me to create a new design. So I'm going to bring in from my customer and the geography hierarchy, bring in, now let's do this in a different way. Let's just start with, the number of customers, uh, actually, number of sessions. And then I could break this down by month, and then remove that filter. And then I could just easily switch this across to a chart. And what happened in 2009? We don't have any data for 2009. 2008, clear this, 2009. No, that's really odd. Oh, maybe I don't, I'm sorry. I think it was 2005, 2006, 2007. So there's the rapid response we're getting, far quicker than the 57 seconds we had before. Okay, to make this a little more visually interesting and to show off the new Bing Maps, what I'm gonna do is introduce that I've got my sessions, convert this to a map. Now in order to work with this, we must have the internet running, which I do. And then I'm gonna bring in that geography hierarchy. It wants to communicate with the Bing Map service. We need to enable that. And then we can see for 2008 where those sessions were happening. Okay, so let's focus on my home country of Australia. And because this is a hierarchy, 
I can drill down just by double clicking. So we'll come in here, double click here, and then I get to see by state where those sessions were happening. Now, my home state's Victoria, so I can continue to drill in. And then we can see here that in summary, there are 129 sessions that took place in 2008. I might be interested to know the gender of the customers that are doing this. So then I can come in here and I can use color. And in doing so, we'll see that each point becomes a pie chart. What happened in January? What happened in February? And this is the reality of what you can do if you have this data and deliver insights from potential big data sources. That's introducing PowerView. So the discussion that I want to work with here then is, well, what happens when your data source is big data? The benefits are that you can surface big data in intuitive ways to promote rapid exploration, analysis, and reporting, as I've just demonstrated. And this was a self-service story. Big data, as also I demonstrated, can be easily integrated with other types of data. In this example, corporate data warehouse that was relational, data feeds to bring in date and time data. So the self-service BI potential is that PowerPivot can load in big data by using the table import wizard, connect by using ODBC as I demonstrated. It's also possible that a DBA could create a linked server to the HD Insight server and they could expose views that are based on the linked server. And then you just query them as database objects. PowerPivot workbooks can become a data source for other experiences. If I publish this workbook to SharePoint and I have the PowerPivot add-in installed, then this can become a data source for other experiences like reporting services, other PowerPivot workbooks, and so on. Now, considerations, and I think this will address the question you had earlier. When working with big data, your biggest problem is going to be the volume, all right? The workarounds are these. Um, minimize the amount of data to retrieve and store. Do this by retrieving a smaller time period. Maybe I don't need from 2005 to 2008. Just bring in 2008 or bring in one month of 2008. Decrease the dimensionality or increase the grain. What that can mean is I don't need to bring in product. If you lower the dimensionality, you can then aggregate the query coming back from the big data store, group by date, customer, and uh, bring in that type of information. Here I brought in granular per request session or request data. I could have grouped by it in the Hive query. The other approach is that you can increase the grain. Maybe we don't need to go down to the minute, the second, we just need to go to the day level, aggregate at the day level. You could take the approach of a sample with a random distribution of data. If you're confident that it's equally distributed, you could then say bring in a tenth of this, and therefore any of the calculations we have should multiply the value by 10. It's not accurate, or sorry, it's not wrong, um, there will be an error margin in there, but it might work around the fact that you've got such large volumes of data that something that's indicative is close enough. All right, so they're the approaches you can take on board. Once you have that data cached in memory, the data model, as you've seen, can then deliver high performance. If PowerPivot can't work with it, because it does have constraints, you wouldn't want to have a document, and you couldn't achieve a document in SharePoint that's greater than two gigabytes, that is a limit imposed by SharePoint on a document size, then this would become a candidate, become a tabular database hosted on analysis services, and then you're constrained by the memory on the server, not by a document limit size. Here are some resources. Don't expect you to scribble them down now, but um, you can download this deck, and there's uh, more information available to you, and of course, there's many more sessions this week um, addressing big data and analysis. Okay, from a related content this week, do you have big data? There's a session. HD Insight, Introduction to Hadoop on Windows, and another session on enriching big data for analysis. Of course, our favorite resources at Channel 9, Learning, TechNet, and MSDN, or now MSDN, and the track resources. So can I open up for any questions? We have about five minutes before we're due to finish. I'll take this question here. Okay, so Office comes in both 64-bit and 32-bit editions. So the question is, when are you going to be driven towards one or the other? There's actually um, two reasons that you'd consider 64-bit, and they would be power pivot because you've got access to more uh, resources in terms of memory. So if you're working with larger sets of data, this would be the recommendation. Data Explorer is a new add-in that will become available for Excel, and that's another consideration for 64-bit. But beyond that, it really shouldn't matter. It is documented somewhere. I don't have the statistics in front of me. Yes, it will be findable. If you, if you have a look on there, I think Dave Wickett from Microsoft has got a blog post on the details about the differences between 32 and 64-bit. 
Okay, so I'm happy to take other questions. What I'll let people know before they go is, do you know that you can win an Xbox 360? <laughs> All right, it's really, really important to us that we get your feedback about sessions. It's really valuable in helping us make the right selection of sessions and pitching it right for the audiences. So, really do encourage you to submit an online evaluation. So if you're about to head off, please take note of this. The QR code will have quick access to the evaluation site. So we really look forward to your feedback on that as well. So let me take this opportunity to thank everyone for your time and attendance, and I hope that this uh, session is of value to you. And then I'm happy to stick around and answer questions for the remaining five minutes. Thank you. Okay, who was next with a question? Yes. So you use uh, kind of CAN static data and then pick data? Did I use CAN static data? Well, yes, so they were CSV files, but what you can imagine is these web servers are still pumping out a lot of data. You could be having it pumped directly into the Hadoop file system. Oh, okay. All right, so basically every time you're querying it through the big data, it will be whatever's currently stored on that file system. So yes, it's dynamic in that sense. Okay, so the question is about power view and how far down we can get. I think, so I, I think it's 200 feet. It's something that you can get right above your house and recognize it, yeah? So you can drill right down to that. Now it's really powerful if you've got lat long storing your data warehouses, sorry, your data warehouses, your physical warehouses, your restaurants, and therefore, uh, you can then have your analysis about, you know, where is our stock at the moment and drill right in, right down to street level if you need to. So long as Bing Maps can geocode it, you can get to it. So the test for that is, go to bing.com forward slash maps, type in the text that you've got to describe your location. If Bing Maps can find it, then you can put that data in your data model and use it to spatially represent your data. Okay. So the question is about power view and parameterization? Yes, parameters for power view? Right, I mean, yes, so if that's your question, if you need to parameterize a power view report, this is not supported. No, it's not. You can, you can interact with the report through the filter pane or by the slices in my example, but you, but you, but you cannot pass in parameters from an outside experience. This is not supported in power view. Okay, very different to what reporting services can do with its parameters collections. Right, so when, you're, when it geocodes and you give it a state name or a country name, I think what it's doing is choosing the midpoint of the true region, so you can't control that. I, I can't control that. The only way you can control that is by putting explicitly latitude and longitude in your data, and then you can control exactly where those points will appear. Okay, good luck. What is the best way to refresh the data? Great question. So in Power Pivot, you would do it explicitly on the client by opening the workbook and refresh. If you want to automate it, you'll need to use SharePoint with the Power Pivot add-in, and therefore when you publish the workbook to SharePoint, you can then configure a data refresh uh, configuration on the workbook itself, and you can then have it refresh 2 a.m. every 24 hours. So it should happen on an off-peak time, uh, because we recognize that that query will be long and slow, so therefore do it in the middle of the morning, and therefore when I come in at eight o'clock in the morning, we've got up-to-date data for the past 24 hours. If you've got multiple data sources, as I understand it, same data source but used by multiple workbooks, you'll have to define those data sources in each model, in each workbook. There's no separate object that you can then connect to to get to the data. So you will have to modify the definition of the data model itself and the query that it's using. The way to get around this, if you can, is that you can connect to a view or a stored procedure and therefore you just have to modify the object on the data source, or even better is if you could use some dynamic function in your where clause that says current month minus one, something like that, that says according to the current date and time, 
you can then offset to actually query the data that you need. That way you should never need to modify the query definition itself. If you must modify the definition, then encapsulate that logic in an external object like a view or store procedure. Failing that, you'll have to then edit the model definition itself every time to change that. Can you programmatically do it, not for Power Pivot? You could potentially do this for an analysis services tabular database. Um, because there are object models and it's XML definition, you could do that as a developer, but that's not a supported path for Power Pivot. So if you need to dynamically and programmatically modify the definition of a tabular database, you can do so. Okay, it would be a developer activity. Um, there are object models that could support this. But this is an extreme thing to do. Really, if you need to automate the change of a definition of a model, and basically it's the query that's the dynamic part, as I've mentioned, I think you'd be better putting that logic in an object in the database, like a view or store procedure, and then you simply modify it. And the next time the model refreshes, it will use that object, and, and, and then it will get the data that you're looking for. Yes, so while you can do a lot of automation of Excel itself, there's no automation for the actual definition of the model embedded into a workbook that is not supported. Okay, no interface for you. Okay. So when you take a Power Pivot workbook and promote it to become an analysis services database, is that your question? Yeah, so essentially you're getting you know, three major things, and that is you're overcoming that size constraint that a workbook will have, so you can work with almost unlimited size according to the resources of what that server has. And then the next thing you have is the ability to define partitions, which allows you to refresh a portion of a single table, typically by time period. And then the next thing is roles, the ability to allow different users to connect to the same model but see a different filtered subset of the model. Power Pivot doesn't have that. It's all or nothing if you have access to the document. Well, you're going to be in trouble if you don't have sufficient resources. So yes, you want to ensure you have sufficient resources. You want to have also sufficient resources because if you process the model, it keeps the model in memory while it's allowing users to query it while rebuilding the current model. So typically, the rule of thumb is you want twice as much as you ever actually need to support the processing of them and allowing the other models to be queried. Now, there is a topic called direct query, which is a pass-through mode, query the model, and then it doesn't cache the data, but it queries the underlying connection, which would be SQL Server. And that can overcome the need to actually cache data on the server, but it introduces latency because you're then slowed down by what the database engine can deliver. But having said that, the same technology that's delivered with analysis services, um, the X Velocity and Memory Analytics Engine, is available through the column store index in the relational product. So therefore, if you use a column store index on the SQL Server table, analysis services will query it and get high performance, and there's no need to cache it in memory. Okay, well, I hope that helps you. Thank you.